Hi, I'm David Glenn uh, with the HDMI Forum. Uh, we're a standards organization that develops all of the future versions of the HDMI specification, starting with 2.0 and then 2.1, which we're very excited about. Uh, a standards organization that's open to anyone who wants to join any company. We currently have 84 members that spread across the industry, so we work with not just device manufacturers who make sources and sinks, we also have a lot of people making components like silicon and cables, people making test equipment. We also have members who are content developers like streaming companies, content media companies, studios. And we all get together and decide on what we want in future versions of HDMI. So in the last few years, we've been developing the 2.1 specification. The focus there was on 8K and 4K 120 as well as gaming features like ALM and VRR, which we're all very excited about coming out in products in the near future. Because um, um, device makers want their devices to be future-proof, right? So they're looking far ahead into the future and say, we want this. How do they agree on what needs to be in there? So uh, in the forum itself, we have uh, regular meetings pretty much every week by phone. We also get together many times a year in face-to-face -face meetings, and this is where we uh, make decisions about what kinds of features we want uh, and technical discussions about exactly how to accomplish those things. And it's a, you know, it's a democratic standards organization, so all the, the active participants get together and uh, make technical proposals. Uh, sometimes there's various technical proposals and we debate the merits of each and often come up with a combined solution. Uh, sometimes there's only one proposal, but a bunch of other companies will join in and, and help make that better uh, and improve it. And then when it's ready, uh, we, uh, we include it in a specification like we did with the 2.1 spec. So um, can you tell a bit of a story as to how you came to these specs for the HDMI 2.1? Is it possible that one of the members wanted AK120 to be there, and then other people said it's too difficult or something? Or, but you can do well, AK120 by compression, right? Yes, we support it by compression. By compression. So there's uh, all these back and forward, and <laughs> you, you pretty much have to judge what becomes possible in the future with all these chips. <clears throat> something like that? Sure, so uh, um, I think uh, the question really is about you know, how do we decide uh, what to put in in terms of future capabilities like 8K60 and 8K120. The 2.1 spec does support 8K120 using DSC compression. Uh, but really uh, it comes down to making sure that the products for the next, uh, let's say, you know, three to five year time frame are going to be uh, affordable. Right? In other words, we don't want to build uh, an infrastructure that has, say, you know, 100 gigabits of bandwidth and force that on to consumers when it's not going to be economical in the next time frame. So, you know, we, we agree as a standards organization what the right bandwidth for the next cycle of standards is, and then we build specifications to that to ensure that we're doing it in a way that all the products can be made at an affordable price point for our consumers. It's already a big jump. Uh, it's 48 gigabit per second. It's pretty big. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, 4K 120 doesn't use all of the 48 gigabits. Even 8K 60 doesn't use all of the 48 gigabits in, in, in many configurations. HDR 10 uses about uh, 40 gigabits. Uh, so, uh, you know, there is a big uh, jump there, and there is bandwidth for some uh, future expansion, especially, like we said, 8K 120 with compression uh, is available within that 48 gig envelope as well. It's pretty amazing amount of data. It's big, and all these chips, they know how to handle this. I mean, they, they have to now, for three, four, five years, handle all this data. Not every chip has to handle 48 gigabits. If you're building a product that is, say, uh, a gaming monitor that's 1080p, then you don't have to support 48 gigabits because you're not going to have that high bandwidth silicon in a 1080p monitor. Uh, it's only really if you're building 8K60 or 4K120 TVs or source devices that you really have to enable that higher data rate. Uh, the HDMI 2.1 spec doesn't always have to run at 48 gigabits. It has lower speeds it uses at 40 gigabits and, and 24 gigabits and various other rates uh, so that you know we'll use the right data rate for the capabilities that uh, your mix of products want to have. 
On the other hand, the cable, the ultra high speed cable that we've defined, it is future proof. So every ultra high speed cable has to be capable of supporting the full 48 gigabits. So that way when you buy uh, a UHS cable, you're ensured that it's future proof and you can use that cable going forward when you do decide to upgrade to 4K 120 or to 8K 60 or beyond. It's just awesome um, industry, no? Uh, when, when people talk about what's to, to look forward to at CES, most of the articles are all mentioning HDMI 2.1, they're all mentioning 8K, and you are um, you pre pretty much organizing the industry around that, right? You're like, uh, you, you're presiding over the forum of the whole, <laughs> everything from uh, American companies to Chinese companies to every, everybody, right? Yeah, we're very excited that HDMI is such a widely adopted standard throughout the world in, in both the consumer electronics space and other spaces like the IT or, or PC ecosystem. Uh, <coughs> and yeah, it, you know, it's great that everyone is, is adopting 2.1 uh, on these advanced devices. Uh, HDMI has been very successful. There's now over 9 billion devices in the world that have been HDMI certified in terms of sources and sinks. And that's certainly going to continue to grow at a, at a very good rate. So more than one per person. That's right. That's <laughs> I certainly lot. have more than one. That's a lot of, uh, <laughs> one thing that I notice is that there's a lot of different types of HD, HDR. And uh, is it a challenge to to specify what goes in or you just support all the different ones in HDMI? Yeah, so with the 2.1 specification on HDR, we took a, a framework where we really define a very flexible uh, mechanism for transporting HDR uh, with uh, wide data rates, so you know, 10-bit, even 12-bit per component if you want, uh, and very flexible ways of transporting metadata. So in the HDMI specification itself, we don't really mandate the different kinds of HDR. We really enable the transport system uh, for different mechanisms. So that way we can work with all of the different standards that are around the world for HDR. And in fact, you know, all of the existing ones are supported by HDMI, and it's certainly possible to write new ones uh, using the HDMI 2.1 infrastructure. Because it is so flexible, uh, it's, it's certainly possible that uh, future HDR standards could be So it doesn't mandate well. what type of HDR? No, it does not mandate a type of HDR. It just gives the infrastructure for transporting uh, very extended de 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 uh, pixel data and metadata. Because HDR is awesome, right? <laughs> Absolutely, really, uh, HDR is awesome. It, HDR it, is it, something I've been working towards my whole career. <laughs> oh yeah? So a uh, long time? Yes. So uh, it's even better than the resolution sometimes. People say yes. that it's more impressive. Yes, well, I, I'm been around long enough that my eyes are no longer that appreciative of, of the very high resolution. But I've certainly, with my eyesight, I'm very appreciative of high dynamic range and wide color gamut. Uh, so those are you know, things that I think even more people can uh, really uh, benefit from than higher resolution. Everyone can benefit from higher resolution unless they're very low vision. Uh, but I think it's more obvious to people when they see high dynamic range and, and wide color gamut. So there's more things that the HDMI 2.1 kind of solves. There's all these sound bars that are sometimes difficult to configure and a little bit uh, uh, weird. Yeah, and we, now we, it's making it easier. Yeah, we, we have the enhanced audio return channel, uh, which really is trying to take uh, that problem and solve it with sound bars and AV receivers. Uh, so it's much more flexible in terms of negotiating capabilities and supporting a lot more advanced audio codecs. Wireless speakers, all this kind of stuff, and it needs to be well, automatic. Well, HDMI is not wireless. It's not wireless, okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. So but that, that would be but all these different kind of speakers and stuff. Because TVs have uh, sometimes good sound, but it's often better to have external sound. Um, Certainly, I think a lot of people prefer external sound. Uh, it is challenging to build very good speakers into small, uh, small bezel TVs, although some of the TV vendors are doing very impressive things, I have to say, with, with their narrow bezels. And then uh, you uh, satisfy also the gamers. And all these, um, how challenging is it to make a TV that has variable frame rates and stuff? Is that a piece of cake or is it really complicated? And how do you make all, everybody agree how that, that should work? Well, making TVs support variable refresh rate is certainly more challenging than it is with monitors. I can't really get into the technical details of how it's done, uh, but we're very happy that uh, you know, VRR is now part of the HDMI standard. 
and uh, that's encouraging more and more TV manufacturers to uh, recognize that gaming is such an important aspect of their market. Uh, and you know, the game console vendors, of course, appreciate that too. Because um, as far as I understand, is the chip, like the GPU, and the CPU, sometimes it can't quite do the full frame rate, or it, it has. Okay, it depends how powerful it is, how, my, how many frames it's going to output. So it's it's really nice for a gamer to have the same rendered on the screen as what the chip can do. Is that the point, right? Yeah, the point of variable refresh rate is that often with games you get into scenes that are just a little bit too taxing for your, your rendering system, your CPU and GPU. Uh, and so if you want to, you can't always achieve, say, 120 frames per second or 144 frames per second. And so in those more complicated scenes, you can fall down to a lower refresh rate. And then when you get back to a, a more typical scene, you can get them to a higher refresh rate. There's also gamers that just prefer in PC gaming to set all their quality settings to extreme <coughs> and ultra. And they're not really trying to get to 144 hertz. They really want to prefer to get a very beautiful looking image at say, you know, more around 60 or 50 hertz uh, or, or FPS. And uh, that allows you to, to work as well with, uh, without having to go and change your display into 60 FPS and back to 120, you can, you can just stay at the one timing. And if the GPU uh, goes down to like 71 hertz or something, it'll just work. Yeah. It'll go match exactly that in yep. real time. Yeah, that's and, right. And it also has to do with uh, uh, lag somehow. So that's also a big deal. Like this is a different standard that people are doing different ways how the GPU is synchronized with the display. Yeah, the HDMI specification doesn't really get into the lag uh, elements of that. So uh, that's, that's sort of a separate issue that the TV vendors and, and some of the other uh, variable refresh rate ecosystems like, like G-Sync, G -Sync, G -Sync, they, 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 they get more into the lag issue than That's not the, part of the spec. No. Exactly how to, so it's again compatible with different. Yeah, the spec is, uh, the HDMI spec is absolutely compatible with, with having reduced lag, but uh, it's, the spec itself doesn't really uh, <coughs> talk about that explicitly. And, uh, when you talk about quick, quick media switching, is like if you watch a movie in 24 frames per second or something like that? Yeah, so this, this is allows you to, uh, you know, often when you're streaming, you're going to be flipping between different clips on say YouTube or whatever, that are all at natively different frame rates, you know, 24 FPS, 30 FPS, 60 FPS, 50 FPS. And with quick media uh, transfer, uh, quick media switching, QMS, uh, you're able to very quickly switch between those uh, using, uh, basically it's sort of an extension of VRR. It's another mode of VRR within the HDMI specification that allows you to then uh, have the transport across the HDMI cable always be at exactly the frame rate of that media. And that allows your display, like your TV, often TVs have very good quality uh, frame rate conversion and allows them to go to that uh, native frame rate or some TVs can then uh, simply display it at, at the intended rate, or some multiple of that. Some TVs will multiply it by two or by three or by five. So like you did 24, they'll multiply it by five and display it at 120. Does it do anything in <coughs> switching the, kind of like the modes? The TV sometimes has like a movie mode and they have like a game mode and, and uh, uh, they, like different way of so showing So that's more the, what we call ALLM. So auto low latency mode, uh, is, is just a signal to really tell the, the source device can tell the TV whether you're playing basically game content that wants low latency uh, or uh, say video content. And some TVs can have options to move between their game modes uh, uh, in terms of their image quality as well. That's really not mandated by the spec. What's mandated by the spec is that when you say you're gaming, the source device says it's gaming, the TV should move into its game mode which is lower latency, uh, then the movie mode, which is higher latency. And often the different latencies are associated with the image processing within the TV itself. So when it's watching movies, it's trying to spend a little bit more time image processing and improving the quality of the picture. Whereas in game mode, it'll spend a little bit less time doing image processing because the focus is on really getting the image on the screen as fast as possible for the gamer. So a lot of all this stuff is to do with metadata, right? It's like it's yes. not it's not the 48 gigabit stuff. It's like small data. It's that's small, right. Yeah. But you ha the industry has to agree how to format this metadata. Yeah, and that's definitely within the HMI specification. We have a bunch of uh, metadata 
specifications. Uh, some of them are very specific, like the ALM and the VRR and the QMS are very specific. This is how you transport that metadata. Some of them are a little bit more flexible within the specifications, like I mentioned around HDR. So there we really provide an infrastructure, and then uh, within that infrastructure, different HDR standards can define how to transport their, their metadata packets. And uh, so part of uh, the CES 2020 has got to do with a new cable, and how, how big of a role has the forum to do with this? Well, this was the first cable that the HDMI forum uh, has defined since it was, uh, um, the forum was created in 2011. And, uh, you know, the first version of HDMI uh, that we worked on was 2.0, and in that case, we used the existing high-speed cable that had been defined back in the, the earlier HDMI specifications. And we increased uh, the ability of the high-speed cable from nine gigabits per second up to 18 gigabits per second. And that's what we've been running with the 2.0 for the last five years. Uh, but with the, the demands we had for 4K 120 and 8K and, and beyond, uh, we needed to move up to 48 gigabits, uh, and that was not possible with the high-speed cable. So we, we did a lot of effort uh, over the last few years to define the ultra-high-speed cable, which we're very proud of. So it's a cable that uh, has been designed from the ground up to not only provide very high bandwidth, but also lower EMI. So we've, we've worked carefully with uh, international EMI standards. This is electromagnetic interference. Basically, making sure the cable doesn't uh, radiate energy that could interfere with your Wi-Fi or your Bluetooth or your cellular network signals. And so all of the uh, cables that are being uh, released for ultra high speed, every single cable design will have to go through a mandatory certification program set up by one of our uh, authorized test centers. And then it'll have a logo or label put on it that allows the consumer to see very clearly that this is a, a certified cable. So anyone can download an app onto their Android or, or, or iOS phone uh, that can allow them to very easily scan the label on the product in the store and confirm that it is, in fact, a certified cable. And part of that certification is the EMI testing itself. So it goes into a very specialized test chamber where we test that the radiation coming out of the cable is with, well within the international standards. Because you don't want to have the, the new 8K cables interfere with your cell phone and stuff. Yes. And Wi-Fi. And yeah. And in fact, you know, if you didn't already have a premium certified cable, it may be worthwhile to get the new cable if you're having uh, wireless interference problems because not all of the older HDMI cables on the market did go through EMI testing, right? So now, even if you're playing games at 1080p or watching 4K60 uh, on sources and sinks that are, are HDMI 2.0, uh, the new cable may help you solve some of those EMI issues because it's been EMI certified. So um, it does interfere with all that stuff, so if it's a bad cable. Well, sometimes. Sometimes. A, a bad cable can be the issue, yes. Is there a way to like measure that somehow? Uh, me measuring EMI interference is, is not easy. It does take expensive equipment. <laughs> uh, but it, you know, basically for users at home, I think the easiest way to sort of mess around with you know, putting your, your cell phone near and trying to see how many bars you get, things like that. But it's not a very exact science. It's not like an app for that. Uh, no, I'm not aware of an app for it, although there's, there's maybe an app for everything, and I could be wrong. <laughs> so, um, uh, is there a price to be a member of the forum, or a price to get this uh, certification? Uh, well, certainly more forum members, uh, there is a, a price. Uh, that's all public uh, information on the HDMI forum uh, website. We, we certainly are always looking for new members, companies to join up. Uh, basically, you have to you know, agree to work in an open standards organization under very typical standards organization rules, and there's an annual fee to be a member of a forum of 15,000 US dollars. So um, often it's mainly the big companies, but there could be smaller companies oh, yeah. that are not part of the forum, and, but they just follow everything you do? Yeah, so there's, there's also a thing called an HDMI adopter. So most companies in the world are HDMI adopters. So they, they work directly with the HDMI licensing authority to become an adopter. And an adopter is a company that is making an HDMI related product. Uh, but to be part of the forum is to really be part of defining the future standards rather than just building a product. So uh, we have 
bigger and smaller companies within the forum, uh, and but they're all focused on, on development of future standards, whereas companies are really just trying to focus on building products with the existing standards, they'll become just HDMI adopters. And that helps fund the whole organization and the, the way you do things, right? Yeah, we're, we're a self-funded organization through our, our membership fees and, and other product fees, yeah. And you have forum where people actually meet up face-to-face? -face. Yeah, we do meet face-to-face -face several times a year. It's not just emails? No, there's a lot of email, there's, there's a lot of teleconferences, and there's face-to-face -face meetings throughout the year. And so I would guess that every company has the top experts in this field, like uh, they really know what they want and how to organize the whole thing. And yeah, we do have do a lot of experts uh, in the forum. Uh, many of them have over 20 years of experience with HDMI, uh, including myself. Uh, some some have been there since the very first days of, of HDMI being defined. The chipset companies, the, yeah, the as I TV said, companies. We have, we have TV companies, we have monitor companies, we have source device companies, uh, we have chipset vendors, we have cable vendors, we have test equipment manufacturers, uh, as well as uh, studios and content distributors. All these streaming sites and stuff, they probably want to be, maybe. Well, we have a few streaming companies, yes. And, and a few the, studio companies as well. And the Hollywoods and all this stuff. We have a few Hollywood companies, And also yes. the Bollywoods and the Chinese, um, <laughs> uh, all the, everything. Yeah. We're, we're, we're certainly interested in having active membership from throughout the industry around the world. All right, so uh, do you feel like the HDMI is so huge now, but it's going to be much bigger? Oh yeah, there's no uh, slowing down of HDMI at this point. Uh, it's uh, it's a, certainly... Uh, with the 2.1 spec, uh, we've got everything we need for the next several years in the industry, at least. Uh, you know, we have 8K60, as we talked about. We even have 8K120 with compression, and, and that's certainly going to take a while for the industry to catch up with. And uh, this gives a lot of uh, nice <coughs> job for the chip designers uh, to fill up this 8K60 and 8K120 with like amazing content. And, yep. um, yes, yeah, so content, you know, I mean, 8K content uh, on the video side, uh, that's taking a bit of time to develop, but certainly we're having the Olympics this year, will be done in 8K, and that's going to create a lot of ecosystem infrastructure for creating video content. There's going to be cameras coming. Yep, there's going to be cameras, there's going to be all of the, the studio and, and, and truck infrastructure system associated with that. Uh, but it's not just, I think, about uh, video, it's also about gaming. Right, and so both uh, Microsoft and Sony have announced that they're going to have 8K support in their next-gen consoles. So that'll also be interesting to see. And uh, I think YouTube has supported 8K for a while, but when you look at the new codecs, they can compress 8K in like something like 100 megabits. That's like yep. much less than 48 gigabits. So um, all this compression doesn't really matter, right? It's just uh, the video needs to be kind of like uncompressed and, uh, and uh, there's a reason why it's 48 gigabits. Or does that make any sense what I'm asking? Well, uh, so uh, typically what happens with uh, video streaming, for example, is, is it gets uncompressed in a source device like in a game console or a, a, a media box like a Fire Stick or, or so forth. And then uh, it often gets mixed with a menu, so you'll have menu items of what, choosing what your next stream is and all that sort of stuff. And then the uh, resulting thing, and often the video gets put into a window. Sometimes you can have like 20 different video clips together in your menu, right? So all of those get decoded separately on the source device, as scaled and composed, and then the final image is shipped over the interface to the display on the HDMI <coughs> interface. And then it makes sense to have huge bandwidth in the last part. Yes, because of the uncompressed nature, it doesn't really make sense to recompress it again and then decompress it again in the TV. Uh, although, as we said, uh, we do support the, the, the uh, compression standard uh, DSC in HDMI, uh, and that actually does enable you to, uh, to, uh, to work even at 4K, for example. You could use DSC with a lower quality cable uh, without having to actually upgrade your cable if you, if you don't have the ability to do so. So if, uh, if the 48 gigabits is kind of like 4X more bandwidth, uh, does that mean 4X more power consumption also? Well, 48 gigabits is about 2.6x of the 18 gigabits we had in, in, in 2.0. Uh, in terms of power consumption, that's not really determined by the specification, that's really by the silicon vendors. It does not mean 4x the bandwidth, though. Uh, it, it, it will uh, power, 
uh, sorry, it doesn't mean 4x or 2.6x. <laughs> you got yeah. me confused yeah, about sorry, 4x. Sorry. Yeah, so in terms of power consumption, that's really not part of our standard. Uh, to go faster bandwidths, uh, at, you know, 2 or 2.6x the bandwidth, uh, will take a little bit more power, but exactly how much more power is really up to the silicon designers to optimize for. Because we also want to have a green planet with not too much power yeah. consumption and stuff. And absolutely, and but it's also important to remember that we don't always run at 48 gigabits. We'll run the link at the rate that's suitable for the mode you're trying to do, <coughs> right? So if you have a, a source and a sink that are, are not needing 48 gigabits, if they only need, say, 20 gigabits, then we are going to train the link to 20 gigabits. Or, or maybe even less. And so that's going to help reduce the power consumption as well because we're not making the link run at full speed all the time. It's also going to make sure that you can potentially operate even with a legacy cable that's not a UHS cable because that older cable that doesn't support the 48 gigabits uh, could be used with a, a lower link rate. And uh, <laughs> without getting in too much into detail, but there's many different kind of chips that know how to encode and decode this stuff, right? And yep. so the, maybe um, some of the chips are kind of including this on the SOC more and more and stuff and doing all kinds of architectures can do it, like uh, x86, ARM, uh, DSP, uh, FPGA, or uh, what, what kind of, uh, how does it work? A6? Well, uh, we're seeing uh, HDMI adopted into silicon from uh, many different types of devices, right? So all the way through the ecosystem, uh, of both handheld devices, camera devices, tablets, PCs, media sticks, um, automotive. Uh, yeah, so th it's, it's a widely adopted standard uh, and it's a technology that can be integrated into a lot of different silicon technologies. You don't need to have a very, very advanced like seven nanometer technology to implement HDMI. Uh, you can do it in, in some of the, the technologies that are often typical of lower cost devices and, and uh, sort of more consumer focused devices rather than the bleeding edge highest end, uh, say, gaming device. And they can do it maybe in the, on the SOC or they, they often need to have a dedicated chip next to the connector. Well, that's really uh, up, up to the, the system designer and the silicon designer, but yes, it can be integrated into SOCs, absolutely. All right, but uh, thanks a lot. And uh, so you're going to be busy here at CES 2020, right? CES is always busy. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what kind of uh, what's going to keep you busy? Does that mean you're going <clears> to <throat> you're going to talk with all the 84 members? Uh, no, one by I'm not one, gonna... you go to all the booths. I'm going to go through all the booths today. Uh, some of them are forum members, some are not. Uh, but I'm always interested to see uh, the products uh, that are coming out. Especially, I think there's going to be a lot of 2.1 products in the booths this year. So yeah. yeah. Uh, the show hasn't quite started yet, uh, but uh, I'm looking forward to checking it out today. How big of a part of the CES story do you think 2.1 is going to be? <clears throat> because everybody, <laughs> well, everybody who's, who did the articles before the show, everybody's mentioning it, right? Yeah, that's been great. The reaction we've had has been great. We hope it continues to be a good reaction, and we're uh, we're very excited about uh, the feedback and the support we're getting on the 2.1 and HDMI and CES.